to exercise it. Well, praise God. If you have your Bibles, can you turn with me, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17. We're going to look at a very well-known story in the Bible. I say a story. It is true. It's part of Israel's history. But a very well-known story, very popular with children. Story of David and Goliath. And in this story, as most good stories, you have a good guy and a bad guy, a hero and a villain, a champion and an underdog. But I trust this afternoon as we look at this event in the history of Israel, we'll take something away from it that is so much needed in our own personal lives and situations because like David, we too have giants to face. We have mountains that need to be removed. We have challenges to overcome. We have trials to go through. And just as David faced a giant, just as David faced a seemingly impossible situation, he got the victory. He overcame. Giants can come down through the power of the Lord. So let's begin. I'm not going to, again, this is a very lengthy chapter. You'll be pleased. I'm not going to read it all, but I do want to read quite a bit of it just to refresh ourselves as to the, the setting of this event. So beginning at verse one. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together to Judah and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes Damimim. And Saul and the men of Israel were pitched together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had on a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine, and ye are servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then ye shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Verse 21. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? Verse 31. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. 
And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and as he had said to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And he took a staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And a sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David and the man that bare the shield went before him. And the Philistine looked about and saw David. He disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. <clears throat> then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands." And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, uh, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took hence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon the face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. We'll leave it there. I have found that as I study the word of God, often you will see an important biblical principle. And that biblical principle comes to us in the form of narrative, a story in the Old Testament. It's then restated as a form of instruction and teaching in the New Testament before finally emerging in the book of Revelation in vivid picture form with apocalyptic imagery. And one such principle that I see this being treated in that way is that of spiritual warfare. Now, when I mention this, the term spiritual warfare, what I'm referring to is this. As believers in Christ, we're in a battle. Not a natural battle, but a spiritual battle. We face a common enemy, the devil, Satan, whose sole objective is to sow disillusion so discourage God's people to bring them to that place where they just turn their backs on God and abandon their faith in him. That's his objective. Satan, our enemy, is defeated. Christ defeated him on the cross. He spoiled powers, principalities, made a show of them openly. The battle has been won. And I want to suggest to you this afternoon that this whole principle of spiritual warfare is woven through the story of David and Goliath. It is then restated in the New Testament in passages such as Ephesians chapter 6. And we see it depicted 
with vivid apocalyptic language in Revelation 12, where we read of a war in the heavenlies, where the dragon and his angels war against Michael and his angels. And that scene in heaven is as a result of what takes place on the earth. And so we want to look at the story of David and Goliath, bearing this theme, this important principle of spiritual warfare. Now, Paul reminds us that the things which were written to Israel are written for our understanding, that through faith and comfort of the scriptures, we might hope. We can learn lessons from the history of Israel. And what important lesson we can learn from this story of David and Goliath is the fact that in verse 16, we are told that this giant Goliath terrorized taunted the people of God twice a day, every day, for 40 days. We are told that Goliath terrorized, taunted God's people every morning and every night. Think about this. Why would Goliath not terrorize the people of God just before lunch? Put them off their appetites so they don't really feel like eating. I mean, if he did that every day for 40 days, he could weaken Saul's army. And why not terrorize them last thing at night before they go to bed? Cause sleep to elude them that they get very little sleep. But you see, although this battle took place and was fought in the natural realm, I want to suggest this was a spiritual battle. And there was strategic intelligence behind Goliath's actions. You see, the people of God sacrificed to the Lord their God every morning and every night. And Goliath purposely targets them, terrorizes them at the moment of sacrifice. At the moment they're about to engage in worship, at the moment their hearts and minds and thoughts are directed towards God, they've prepared themselves to worship him, that's the precise moment Goliath attacks, terrorizes them, taunts them. Have you ever had this experience? You're maybe going on the internet late at night or you're, 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 you're searching or you're checking your Facebook or whatever or maybe you're watching something on television and you're wide awake. It's got your full attention. But the moment you open your Bible to read it or you want to get down to pray, it's one distraction after another. The, four, the, the, the doorbell goes, a text message comes through or you feel drowsy and you want to go to sleep. That is not coincidental. Just as Goliath purposely terrorizing God's people at the precise moment they're about to engage in worship, there's an intelligence behind Goliath. Not only did he terrorize them twice a day, he did it for 40 days. And the number 40 is significant in the history of Israel. Israel wandered in the wilderness for how many years? 40 years. And it almost seems like Goliath is bringing up their history, reminding them of their past. I wonder, has the devil ever reminded you of your past? You're a child of God. And you're serious about him. And every so often, the enemy comes and reminds you of the way you used to be. Or maybe you're here this afternoon and you're not a, a believer. You've never given your life to Christ. And the enemy is saying to you, sure, look at the things you've done. Look at the way you've lived. There is an intelligence behind this. Yeah. 
it's not part of the story, but just in line with the number 40, Jesus was tempted of the devil for 40 days. And there is a parallel between Jesus in the wilderness with the wanderings of the children of Israel. But here Goliath terrorizes, taunts God's people at the moment of sacrifice, twice a day, every day, for 40 days. See, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 to put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And the word wiles literally means stratagems, intelligence, plans of the enemy. You see, the enemy knows you, knows me, knows our weaknesses. I mean... It's not a very spiritual thing to say. But if you were in the enemy's shoes, how would you entrap yourself or cause yourself to fall? You know your own weakness, as do I. And there's an intelligence who will try to discourage God's people. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Although this battle was fought in the natural realm, its roots, I believe, were of a spiritual nature. This was not the first time the people of Israel were fearful of a giant. Remember the story when Moses sent out the spies to spy out the land? And as they're drinking in the delights of the land, all the fruit, the pomegranates, whatnot, suddenly into their line of vision, they see these giants and their hearts melt with fear. All that is except two, Joshua and Caleb. Caleb had a different spirit. But Israel had encountered giants before. And only two said, we can take them. And like Caleb, it takes us as believers to have a different spirit, if you like, a different attitude, a different mentality. Seeing those giants from God's perspective in order to take them. Because if we don't, they will mock us, they will defy us, they will taunt us, and they won't go away. And like Goliath taunting the people of God, it would take another Joshua, another Caleb, someone of that caliber to take down Goliath. It's interesting, but in verse 5, we read that Goliath's armor is of brass, King James says, or meal. But in the Hebrew, it says scales. It was scale armor. And what's interesting, if you think about it, and I want to be careful that I don't press this too far, but I think there's a pattern emerges throughout Israel's history. But if I were to ask you which animal has scales, I didn't say fish now, I said an animal. There's one obvious one springs to my mind. A snake, a serpent. And what's interesting is that in the Genesis account, the word translated serpent means shining one. You see, Paul describes the devil as an angel of light. Ezekiel, in talking about the origins and Lucifer's fall, describes this being arrayed in topaz and diamond and beryl and all precious stones. Yes, this, this creature in the garden was serpentine in appearance, but was shimmering and shining. The Hebrew word is nakesh. And here you have Goliath terrorizing, taunting God's people, arrayed in scale armor that is glinting in the sunlight. And I think there's, there's a pattern here where you have the serpent coming to God's people way back in Genesis. And here you have another being, a red in steel armor, shining and shimmering, coming to taunt 
the people of God. And what makes it more interesting, whenever Saul was anointed as king, one of his first challenges was to help the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead because a man called uh, Nahesh, same word from the Hebrew, a serpent, shining one, came and led besiege to the inhabitants and they needed help to be liberated. And now here in Goliath, if you will, you have another serpent-like being in Israel's garden that needs taken care of. David and Goliath has its roots in the spiritual realm and the person really initially responsible, tasked to deal with Goliath was Saul. He was the king. And Saul was somewhat of a giant himself, albeit on a smaller scale. He stood head and shoulders above everybody else. But you see, as I've suggested, this was really a spiritual battle. And because it was a spiritual battle, what Saul needed more than anything to win this battle, he did not possess. Because it was a spiritual battle, Saul needed the power of the Spirit. But we read the Holy Spirit had departed from him. But by contrast, we read that when Samuel anointed David to be a future king, the Spirit of God came upon him from that day forward. And so what, Paul, what Saul lacked, David possessed. And David arrived at the battlefield. And his arrival coincided with Goliath's daily ranting and ravings as he would taunt God's people. And David is absolutely disgusted, repulsed at this Philistine giant. This giant in David's eyes is guilty of blasphemy. And the penalty for blasphemy under the law is death. And David is ready to take out this giant. And he hears all that's going to be done for the person who takes a mighty. The, the king will give him his daughter and marriage, enrich his family and make them free. That means exempt them from tariffs and military service and so on. And David's ready to take this giant. And we're all familiar, most of us, I'm sure, with the story that Saul gets to hear about David's enthusiasm and wanting to take down this giant where all the other people are terrified. David's ready. He rises to the occasion. And Saul, of course, tries to dissuade him. And what David says next is something we all use and to encourage ourselves and other people. David said to Saul, look, I've looked after my father's sheep and when a lion or a bear came, God gave me the victory and I, and I, and I saved those sheep. I rescued them. And this Philistine, he's no different. He's, he's ceased being human really in my eyes. He's just another animal. Now we look at David's words and as I said, we use them to encourage ourselves and others. And rightly so, you know, God delivered David from the lion and the bear and he'll delivered him from Goliath and he's delivered you from past problems and he's given you the victory and this situation will be no different and rightly so. But as I've been thinking about this, I've asked myself the question, which was the greater challenge, Goliath or a lion? Now think about this. Goliath is big and dangerous, deadly dangerous at close quarters. But at a distance, just how dangerous is he? He's big and he's weighed down with all this heavy armor and he's slow. He's not very fast, not very mobile, close quarters deadly. But when you contrast that with a lion, a lion is strong, powerful and quick and deadly at close quarters and can run after you and pin you down. And the reason I say this, bearing in mind that I'm, I'm suggesting that although this story is in the natural, its roots are in the spiritual, I say this because you see our enemy as believers seeks to and is very good at deflecting and distracting our focus and thoughts 
that he directs them off God and puts them on the problem. He's very good at creating smoke screens to get us sidetracked off God and onto the problem. And he'll magnify the problem to gigantic proportions, bigger than it really is, so that we're cowering in fear under it. And I think that's what he was probably doing to the people of God, relying on his sheer bulk and size and intimidating them at the point of worship every day. This was, if you, to use a, a, an ordinary secular term, in a sense, psychological warfare as well as spiritual warfare. But David's not afraid. In fact, whatever situation you're facing, and I'm not for one moment suggesting, by the way, that the devil is behind every problem you face. But what I am suggesting is he's very good at exploiting the problem and bringing fear and confusion and worry and anxiety and making it appear bigger than it really is. But we should do what David himself suggests we do. Instead of looking at the problem, let's oh magnify the Lord. Oh magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. David said, I magnify the Lord with thanksgiving. We have a lot to be thankful for. And when you magnify something, what do you do? You make it bigger. A magnifying glass will make an object bigger. Magnify the Lord. Now, we can't make him bigger, obviously, but see him, as I was saying this morning, see him in his greatness, in all of his almightiness and majesty and power. And when we look into his wonderful face, the things on earth do grow strangely dim. They get smaller and pale into insignificance. And so David would not be dissuaded by Saul. But then Saul says, all right, you can go and fight him. And we get an insight into what happens next, into Saul's character. Because Saul wants David to wear his armor. You see, Saul is of the mentality. That in order to defeat the enemy, you have to become like the enemy. Yeah, yeah. So Goliath wore armor, so you have to wear armor, David, if you want to beat him. But you see, you don't need to become like a king of the nations in order to fight kings of the nations. You don't need to look like the enemy in order to fight the enemy. And as believers here seeking to fulfill the Great Commission, let me say this, we don't need to look, act, dress like the world in order to win the world. Amen. This is a spiritual battle. Satan is the God small g of this world who has blinded the minds of unbelievers. It's a spiritual battle. Evangelism is a spiritual battle. But every time in the name of trying to win the lost, that we dress, act, look, conform to the world. You know what we're doing? We're putting on Saul's armor. We are adopting the method of a man who does not possess the Spirit of God and we're trying to fight and win a spiritual battle. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Paul says, don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. David discards Saul's armor. Instead, takes his sling and five stones. And what's interesting about that, just on a, on a side note, in Judges chapter 20 and verse 16, we are told that 700 men of the tribe of Benjamin who were left-handed were expert with a slingshot. And that is significant because Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. And here David adopts a weapon, employs a skill that Saul's people are renowned for. There may even have been some there in Saul's army who were skilled just as well as David with a sling, but none of them rose to the occasion. And so David takes his sling and he takes five stones. He's ready to face Goliath. Verse 43 is interesting 
because the end of it says, as Goliath approaches to David, it says the Philistine cursed David by his gods. This is what I mean when I say the roots of this battle were spiritual. This is spiritual warfare. Goliath is invoking power from his gods. He's turning to false gods for help in this battle. Why would he do that, actually, when you think about it? If he thinks David's just a young guy who's not very big compared to him, yet he still feels the need to look to the spiritual sense realm, albeit the wrong realm, for help. And David counters as Goliath curses him by his gods in verse 45. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. This was not like two boxers bad-mouthing one another before a fight. This was spiritual warfare. This was spiritual warfare. The battle already was taking place in the spiritual realm before David unleashed that first stone. So David comes to meet the giant, and David's not afraid. David knows his history. He knows that a precedent has, has been set. He knows about Joshua and Caleb taking these giants. He's not afraid. And he has a word from the Lord. Because Samuel said, David, you're going to be the next king. And David knows that God watches over his word to perform it. He upholds the integrity of his word. What God has promised, he brings to pass. And you see that in the life of people like Abraham, Paul the Apostle. Having received a word from God, you see it coming to fulfillment, irrespective of the obstacles or giants or problems they meet along the way. God's word will not fail. It didn't fail Abraham. It didn't fail Paul. It didn't fail Peter. It didn't fail David. And it won't fail you. It won't fail you. Goliath cursed David. By his God. David comes to him in the name of the Lord. And he gets his sling ready. I don't know how many revolutions per second as he begins to whirl that sling. But what I have found out is apparently the velocity of that stone when it leaves the sling is akin to a bullet coming out of a handgun. Powerful. But let's not forget. It wasn't just velocity at work here. There was another power at work. The power of Almighty God behind that stone, directing its trajectory to hit the perfect target, to take down that giant. David lets that stone go, and it flies, and it takes that giant down. Then David goes, draws out Goliath's own sword, and takes off his head. Now let's just go back a little bit and consider. Goliath cursed David by his gods. He invoked the help of a false god. I mentioned this this morning. Psalm 115 says, those who worship idols become like the idols they worship. And what you have in the case of Goliath is literally, <coughs> now this morning I made the, the, the parallel with spiritual application, our physical senses and our spiritual senses. But in the case of Goliath, he literally did become like the very idol he worshipped. You see, the Philistines worshipped a god called Dagon. Do you remember in the history of Israel when the ark was in Philistine territory? When they had captured the ark, they put it in the house of Dagon. And they go in the next morning and what do they see? They see their god Dagon lying flat face down on the ground. Remind you of anybody? It's exactly what happened to Goliath. They prop Dagon up. They go back in the next day. What do they see? Dagon, their god, flat, lying flat face first in the ground and his head off. Exactly what happened to Goliath. Goliath worshipped Dagon, invoked his help, and ended up looking just like him. See, God is demonstrating something 
in the natural and in the unseen realm. This is spiritual warfare in this well-known Bible story. You know, when I, when, I, when I think about this, I think, I mean, what a great strategy David employed against Goliath. Talk about being unconventional. How come nobody else could think about that? And the only answer I have is the wisdom of God. Yeah. I mean, it, when you look in hindsight, it's so simple, so powerful, so effective. Nobody else thought of it. But you see, David was a man after God's own heart. A man who knew intimacy with God. A man who would write, Oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul longs for you in a dry and thirsty land. Oh, to see your power, to see your glory. And it wasn't just Solomon, David's son, who knew all about wisdom. David knew about wisdom. You read David's Psalms, you see him talk about wisdom. And God has wisdom for you and he has wisdom for me. James tells us, if anyone lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And if you read James in that context, you will see that God specifically gives wisdom for those going through trials. He gives us wisdom to enable us to make sense of the trials we face, to see them and understand them from God's perspective, and to see how the Lord would have us respond that we would come out of them for his glory stronger, more mature, to be a blessing and to have greater effectiveness with others. David killed Goliath. The battle was only over temporarily because you see another giant would come after David. Another giant on a smaller scale, but another giant who stood head and shoulders above everybody else, Saul. And like Goliath, Saul also would come after David with a spear driven by an evil power. And the battle with Saul required a different strategy. But David got victory, became king over all Israel. David's battles weren't over. Neither are yours. Neither are mine. Whenever Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days by the devil and put him to flight, we read the devil left him for a season. The implication being he would return. And you see, we can never drop our guard. Now let me say this. The battle has been won. Peter tells us to be sober, to be vigilant. He doesn't say be paranoid. He doesn't say be fearful. We're to be about the Father's business. But we are to be mindful at times the enemy will try and discourage, disillusion, confuse us, deceive us. But the Lord has given us everything we need. He's given us his son. He's won the battle. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit, power of the blood of Jesus. He's given us the victory. We're not called to win. The battle's been won. We're called to preserve, maintain, and enforce that victory whenever the enemy would try and discourage and distract God's people. The victory has been won. I don't know what battles you may be facing today. I don't know what giants, figuratively speaking, are, are mocking you. I do have a sense, though, that the enemy is reminding someone here and I don't know if you're a believer or a non-believer, but he's reminding you of your past. If you're a child of God this morning, the Lord says through the prophet Jeremiah, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. God doesn't have amnesia. It's not that he, 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 he doesn't remember. Yes, he does. But when he says, I will remember them no more, what he says is, I will never, ever again Bring that up again. I'll never treat you in light of what you've done. If you've repented of it, put it under the blood. That's it. I'll never ever treat you in light of that. I'll never bring it up again. Such is the victory of Calvary and the power of the blood of Jesus that cleanses from all sin. And if you're not a believer and the enemy's using that as a stumbling block to hold you back, that promise can be yours. As you come to Christ, 
recognizing you're a sinner and that you need a Savior and that He has died for you and that He shed His blood, His precious blood, that you might be forgiven of your sins, that you might know new life in Him, that He would come and indwell your heart by faith through His Spirit. He'd make you a new creation. The old will pass away. And for you, that promise also can be true. He will remember your sin no more. Whatever the giant, there's a sling. And there are five stones in your hand, figuratively speaking, because he's given us everything we need. And there's power in the name of Jesus. And God tells us to stand, to stand, to stand still. Because the battle belongs to him. And it's the Lord who fights for us. He fights for us. He fights for us. Thank you, Lord. Can we just turn our gaze, our thoughts towards him?